Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Arseholics podcast on Sunday night after uh, an amazing day at the Emirates on Saturday. I've got, well, you've got me, Raj, and you've got Aaron and, and Mize with me today. Hey, guys, how's it going? Good. Very good. Very, very good. What a We're, weekend. What a week. What a week. What a, a week, week and a weekend. I mean, Mize, you and I had the pleasure, obviously, going to Chelsea, um, which we reviewed, and uh, but all the Arseholics got to come together on Saturday for, for United and uh, wow, I mean, how often do you beat Chelsea and United in the same week? <laughs> how good is that? Yeah, it's been good. I mean, I'm I was definitely one who after those last three games, the last three games, those three games, which I think we all know what you're talking about, where we lost all three. I was very much like, this is done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you I and everyone was, else, mate. I think yeah. we like we in our group chat, we were like, Mike, you asked the question, what percentage do you think? That yeah. we are like going to get top four now, or how optimistic are you? And I was like, I'm 99 sure that we're not going to do it now, mm. um, because I gave us no hope of beating Chelsea and United. I think I think maybe we could have probably beaten United. I would have predicted that one, but you know, doing both with the way we were playing, with the players we had out, like fair play to Arteta and the team, because this is a, it's a huge, huge achievement to just get back into the race. Um, like regardless of what everyone else is doing, I've been really, really impressed. It's true, isn't it? I mean, it, for, for a whole bunch of reasons, you play Chelsea on a Wednesday, it takes a lot out of you. You know, we're playing the Saturday early kickoff. It's very little time. Man United had the extra day as well. I think it's something that we need to get used to. And I think, Mize, you and I were talking about this the other day when we were reflecting on Liverpool, who played in an FA Cup semi-final yeah. and a couple of days later play Man United and, you know, blitz them for energy off the park. A cup right? semi-final and, against Man City as well. It will exactly, mm, exactly. Yeah. And played basically their first team in that game. And I remember mm. we were talking about the fact that we need to, to, to stop using, well, it's not that we've, we've used that as an excuse, but the top teams have to play frequently and they have to just be on it and they don't get to say they're tired. And I love that because, you know, we, we've mm. got a, we've played Man United at home. And let, let's talk a little bit about that because the, the team... Um, the, you know the the lineup was quite similar ish um you know structurally it was different and holding you know didn't play but you know effectively we we went with a familiar sort of uh, structure so we had the back four of Tavares at left back and Cedric at right back and Ben White Gabriel reunited as center backs and then we went with the two holding midfielders so El Neni retained his place playing with Xhaka and um and then Smith Rowe Odegaard and, and Saka and in front of them another man who retained his place uh, Eddie, Eddie Nketiah after the two goals he scored against Chelsea it was probably always going to happen I, I mean Mize how did you feel when you saw that lineup were you pretty pleased did you, did you think that was what we should have gone in with yeah pretty much um, I think the the switch for the Chelsea game made sense um, you know going away to Chelsea we expected it to, expect it to be probably a tougher game than it was and I think you know you're playing at home against a very um, you know a United team that have just been thrashed by Liverpool very very low on confidence um, and I think especially the fact that it's a home game you know you want to take the game to them so you know going back to four at the back made complete sense and I think yeah the the you know the El Nene, keeping El Nene in keeping Enketia in you you you, you I mean, like based on their performances against Chelsea, you you can't they basically made themselves undroppable, right? So, um, um, yeah, I think I was relatively happy with the team team selection. Um, yeah, no no kind of complaints from me. And obviously, you know, Tommy Asu back on the bench was another big, um, you know, kind of big news, big inclusion um, in the squad because we've been waiting for him to come back. So, yeah, overall overall pretty happy. Yeah, it's. And I think the lineup as well, I think when everyone saw it, it was nice to ha ha not have any real surprises. It felt like everyone, generally speaking, the fan base thought that's something that we should be going in with, given all the injuries, etc. Like you said, really nice to have Tommy Asu back on, on, on the bench. Aaron, it was a bit weird though, wasn't it? Because I, I felt that, you know, we played Chelsea, there was amazing atmosphere at, you know, at Stamford, it was amazing. And now we've got this early kick off against Man United. It's huge. We've got momentum. Um, and and I, I I sort of felt, as it often happens, I think in in football, the fans sort of replicated the team a little bit in terms of performance because mm. we were we, it felt like we were okay. And obviously Arsenal went two 0 up, you, you know, fairly fairly quickly in you know in, in, in some respect. But the fans were still a bit nervous. I felt in the first half, and so were the team. I mean, do you want to talk us through that a little bit? Yeah, I I think it's the dynamic of the opposition because. We've all seen Man United get 
like absolutely battered on Wednesday when they played Liverpool or Tuesday, whatever it was. And when they turned up, I think with us having beaten Chelsea, there was this expectation of like, actually, we need to go and, you know, we should be winning this game. We were favourites, I think. And mm-hmm. if we had dropped points yesterday, I think a lot of fans would have been disappointed, regardless of like, because of the fact we'd just beaten Chelsea. If we had lost to Chelsea and that was our fourth loss in a row and then we'd got a point, people would have maybe looked at that a bit differently. But the pressure was on us to go and get a win. And then we scored first and then we scored again. And then, was that right? Yeah, we went 2-0 up. And then yeah. Um, yeah. when the fact that they got their goal immediately afterwards, I think that just created panic in the fan base. And mm. you know, I looked, I, I remember the game in the first half, especially I felt like we did make a few mistakes and we were a bit ropey. Um, and then that very much reflected in the crowd. And then it almost permeated back into the team a bit. And I wasn't yeah. sure. I was like, were we as a crowd making the team nervous yeah. <laughs> or was the team making us nervous? And it was, it was a very weird but, dynamic. I, th- I think, I think definitely what you just said about the, the crowd making the team nervous, like the crowd were very, very good. Again, as we keep saying, every time we, we meet up and talk, right. The crowd away and home have been fantastic this season, especially, but I think there were, there were a few occasions where, you know, Tavares obviously had kind of a, a bit of a up and down game, I guess you could say um, a bit of a dodgy game again. Um, uh, um, and there were there were you know he he was one player that seemed to be targeted a little bit by by the fans, which I thought yeah. was a bit unfair. All things considered, you know, still a you know very young player, new players coming in, um, uh, kind of cold this season. You know, he only had a, had a few games at the start of this season, and um, yeah, uh, and, and I think similarly with Cedric as well. There were a few yeah. times when we were trying to play out from the back, which we know is what we're we're going to do as a team and what Arteta wants to do. Um, and, and, and that's the way he wants to play. So, um, when it doesn't quite go right, you know, it's frustrating and we all, you know, we all kind of, yeah, air our frustrations, but again, there were, you know, towards Cedric, there seemed to be a a couple of times where he gave the ball away in dangerous positions and the crowd getting on his back a little bit. And I thought that was a, you know, that was that it doesn't help basically, right? Like you've got to back the team, you've got to back the players, um, even in the kind of like the hard times. And so, yeah, I I definitely think there was a case of, uh, or there were a, a few, situations or examples of where yeah the crowd um they didn't really help when it came to sort of giving that players a little bit yeah you know what annoys me about that like for example people having a go at Tavares Mm -hmm. and like yeah he made mistakes right and you don't want players to make mistakes and they should be playing better I get that right but what I'm thinking is like what what do you want to happen now do you want to take him off and because there's no one else like who what are you going to do if we take Tavares off yeah, are we yeah. going to move Jacker to left back? Or you I, I, I think I think some fans do kind of do expect that. I think some fa- or they're just expecting like every single player on the pitch to put in a eight or nine out of ten performance every single game. I'm not that, sure why that's they're okay. expecting that's, that. That's but that's fair, right? Like we all expect our players well, to play well. Yeah, but, but the players are, are going to make mistakes, right? Yeah. Are we overthinking it? At the end of the day, we're we're fans who are at a game experiencing something in the moment, and actually, that's just kind of you know when sometimes you articulate your frustration at something very specific that happens in a game you're not necessarily thinking about the repercussions per se. It's just a natural kind of feeling of, oh, for God's sake, kind of that kind of thing. Yeah, but I don't know, but I felt, and again, I think, I don't think this is the reflective of the whole game, but there were periods where, especially between like the 60th and 70th minute when it was 2-1, mm. where we were giving the ball away a lot and Man United were on top, that like, I felt that it was on the verge of turning and it, was, it wasn't yeah. ugly. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like peak Emery era where um, it was bad, but I was a bit surprised at that point. And generally, actually, the the vibe this season has been very, very supportive, very, very behind the team. But it just seems like at that point, the entire fan base and the crowd who were there were feeling the pressure. And that was their way of you know venting to be like, someone change it. You've made a mistake. This isn't good enough. And yeah, that, that's football at the end of the day, right? Like we can't all be perfect. We're emotional people. And you're right. This is how we, you know, share our frustrations with the team yeah and you know like I, I probably should have opened with this actually because um i'm surprised i didn't uh you know we did score after two minutes and only a, only an absolute genius <laughs> only only a godlike <laughs> genius could have predicted who was going to score first right and you know if that godlike genius happened to put money on that person scoring first <laughs> or scoring any time at odds of 26 to 1 and 12 to 1 respectively 
that would have been a genius thing to do, right? <laughs> Wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, I think just got to applaud it. Applaud you on this one. Like, you, you know, a lot of your predictions are complete nonsense. And They're rubbish, complete nonsense. But, um... Absolutely, <laughs> I completely agree with you. But for the first bet that I've placed this season, I mean, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, so for those of you, I mean. For those of you that Raj hasn't told yet, because I'm sure he's probably told about a million people about yeah, this and for, Yeah, and if um, you're not one of the 10 people who like the tweet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> um, Raj, before the game, put money on Nuno Tavares to score first and or and or score any time. I think you put both, right? Put both, Which, fiver on both, mate. I, I don't know what the odds were, but um, no, fair play. That's um, So yeah, and there was this moment, I remember when, because we, we obviously sit at the opposite end, right? So we saw the ball <laughs> go in and then we saw someone score and we obviously celebrated because we've scored and i think there was this moment we were like oh wait said, who scored i, I said yeah. to raj I, i'm pretty sure I, I said to raj yeah you I did it's yeah. yeah and then i didn't want to i didn't want to confirm it because i wasn't sure myself yeah. and, then they, and, then, and then there was this wait and then we were like and then they announced it and then there's this second celebration by, by us <laughs> and then i think the people sitting around us were just like what's going on here this is a bit weird <laughs> <laughs> the worst bit is right like, when i've yeah. told other people about it they just they're in the instant reaction is that i must put loads of crazy bets on a game by game basis <laughs> you know what i mean and this is like this genuinely was my one moment but anyway um i digress like um <laughs> sorry like i I, don't, I really took us like completely off topic but i think <laughs> but i think like if we actually look at the game and you know some of that nerves that you talk about that came through with the fans etc it was interesting wasn't it because even though pretty much even after we scored when it was 1-0 and even after it was 2-0 man united always seemed like they had chances they always seemed like they were causing us some kind of problems um and i, I wanted to ask you guys a, a bit about that because obviously ronaldo comes and he, you know he scores he makes it 2-1 listen we sort of thought that was inevitable ronaldo always scores against us he's an amazing player but against chelsea there were a couple of incidents incidents including the first goal that Chelsea scored where you could probably have questioned Ramsdale on that and you could have questioned a little bit um his kind of communication with the defenders because I think Martin Keown said this a while ago where he basically said one thing he felt that Ramsdale has to stamp out of his game is he needs to stop shouting at the centre-back so much he needs to stop shouting at players basically so much when something goes wrong because actually you know it's not a very good idea and you know what in fairness he's not Peter Schmeichel yet so maybe you know you can't do that um against Chelsea so there you know there are a couple of times you might have thought okay you know Ramsey you probably should have done better maybe you need to calm down stop blaming everyone else similarly against you know against Man United Ronaldo's goal I mean that was really really poor comms right it was really poor you're, you, understanding. you're, you're putting that down to Ramsdale I'm not. I'm actually asking you the question. Oh, right. Is is there something? Uh, is there an issue there in terms of communication with our defenders and Ramsdale that could be levied? I don't know who the blame is at. You know, is it Ramsdale? Is it the, the defenders? I think the one thing I know for sure, and I think we all agree on, is that incident which Ronaldo scored. I mean, it it just it just looked silly. We just looked a bit silly. Mm, Ramsdale yeah, doesn't yeah. come for it. Defenders don't come for it. They've been playing together for a while now. I mean, what do you think, my Yeah, I mean. So I've watched it back a couple of times. Um, I think it's a combination. Yeah, maybe it is a communication issue. Uh, to be honest, it's not something I necessarily picked up on previously, there being a communication issue between Ramsdale and um, you know the defence. When I watch this one back, I, I kind of feel like Gabriel should just take ownership of the whole situation because I think it's one of those balls where Ramsdale's probably waiting to see if sort of someone gets a touch or what's going to happen. I'm kind of delaying his decision on what to do to the very last moment. But, and, and where the ball lands to Ronaldo, Ramsdale still kind of, I don't know how far, a couple of yards or a yard away. Whereas Gabriel just seems to let Ronaldo just kind of ghost past him and get in, get in front of him. And I feel like, you know, again, Gabriel is a relatively young centre-back. If you're talking kind of Premier League experience terms um, and you can compare it, if you're comparing him to kind of elite centre-backs, um, in the league and I feel like yeah I feel like an elite sense back just kind of cleans up the whole whole situation he doesn't really care if he clears if he if he takes out the goalkeeper if he takes out Tavares if he takes out one of his other players 
Um, but you just make sure that the ball doesn't get anywhere near the opposition player. And so that was probably the biggest disappointment for me. I, I, when you watch it back, though, it does look like there is some sort of miscommunication because it feels like no one knows what to do in that situation. Mm. Everyone just kind of watches the ball and no one takes ownership. But that, I think then that's where, you know, your kind of big commanding leader, leader in the defence um, yeah, just just goes for the ball and clears it, and, and it's just like kind of a no nonsense situation. Don't mess around with it. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of my take on it. I, I also think the fact that it's that it's the fact that it's Ronaldo definitely plays a part. Mm. I reckon if that was Marcus Rashford doing that, I reckon Gabriel probably goes in. And I because I, know, I reckon it's probably a bit intimidating for players to play against Cristiano Ronaldo at least for the first 15, 20 minutes if they've never done it before. Um, because like, you know, it's, it's, that, it's like a legend, it's pretty football. bad think, though, isn't it? Right? Like, no, it's, talking, it's, I mean, you're right, you're right, you're right. It's, it is bad, but I reckon it's, it's just they, they showed him a bit too much respect. I, I yeah, I, I think we said that in the first half, yeah. right? I think they did, but that is pretty. I don't know, like, I feel like if you're, if you're, um, I don't know, uh, who got promoted last season, one of the like Norwich or someone who's just come yeah. up and every single player's never played a minute of Premier League football, and they're like, oh my god, I'm playing against like Ronaldo. I uh, never thought this would happen in my career. Fair enough. But these guys are, you know, they're playing for Arsenal. They're playing for a big club. Um, a lot of them are internationals and so on. And I just feel like that's a, I don't know, it's a bit that, if that is the case, that's a, quite a weak mentality. Oh, I agree. Uh, it is weak. It's not an excuse. Um, yeah. But it's, it is a bit, it, I just felt that the dynamic was a bit interesting and they freaked out just, and that probably maybe causes a split second of hesitation. There was Because, you know, Ronaldo's movement is so good. I think we commented on this in the game, that his movement is ridiculous. It is. And, yeah. They um they probably were like just hesitated to say, should we watch and see where he goes? Or like who's taking this? Is the keeper coming out? Oh crap, it's Ronaldo. Um, and all of those things just makes them hesitate. And you're right, I think Gabriel should deal with it, if not Tavares, and between them, and then yeah, between them they should deal with it, or if not Ramsdale, one of them has to take control. Yeah. And at that point, you accept expect the senior center back, which is Gabriel, to do that. And he didn't, and I think that's that's a bit weak. So yeah, I don't I don't really blame Ramsdale, even though when we see it, because we sat behind the goal, we kind of see him come, yeah. and then not get there. It looks a bit weak on his part, and maybe if he does stay on his line, he has a better chance to and to see it again. But no, I definitely put that down to centre backs. Fair, and it's a, do you, do you think that that was sort of an example, or that that was sort of a, it sort of typified a little bit of a little bit of the nervousness or the nervous energy that it seemed like a lot of our players were playing with around that time. And I imagine that's not obviously just because of Ronaldo. I imagine it is the, you know, the occasion, what's at stake, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but let's talk about some of the, you know, there's a lot to be positive about. We won three, one. Okay. There's a lot to be positive about. And there's a lot of those things that I really want to talk about, talk to you guys about. Uh, Aaron, and I'd love to get your thoughts on, uh, kind of relating to a question that you asked Mize and I to mm -hmm. answer, you know, the other day. <laughs> we, you asked us about, you know, whether El Nenny's performance against Chelsea uh, meant that essentially he's, he, he, you know, it's it's his place to lose now for the rest of the season. And, you know, whether Lokong was out the team, El Nenny does start again. Uh, you know, we joked about how El Nenny's a sort of player that you give him one start out of nowhere, he's phenomenal, and maybe just take him out again because that's his thing done. But it's two starts in a row, uh, you know, against a big club, um, in a big game, how do you think he did? Yeah, I thought he did well. I think there are there's a little bit of people getting a bit carried away. Um, what is it? Yeah, you, thought... you, you, do you mean he's not Perlo reincarnated? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think, look, he's look. I love him as a player in terms of like how he's you know dealt with his position in the squad. In that he's very much accepted. I'm a squad player. I'm not really like going to push for starts and you know you need El Nenis in your squad and that's cool um I saw you know a lot of people think discussing whether we should give him a new contract and you know I think the the biggest thing for me is actually when you see what El Neni does it only kind of reinforces to me that like Lokonga is just not there yet because actually when there's a big gap between what El Neni gives you and then what Lokonga gives you that's not really great because you know we all accept that Elneny is a very very limited player although I think you know the criticism of him has always been that he doesn't play forward passes I actually thought he did that quite well mm. on Saturday um but look he's never gonna 
you know, come up, become a first team regular. But actually, you know, it does make you think when we were messing about with like weird solutions for our midfield, why didn't we play one of our central midfield squad players in on any? Um, and I think the reason was because we had probably want we were wanting to give Lukonga a chance to make that spot his own, which was the right thing to do, right? If we were playing on any, a lot of us would be saying, why aren't we giving Lukonga a chance? So, um, yeah, and I think it's, look, he, he looks good in that role. He, it's very comfortable. He's very disciplined. He's not spectacular. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, I don't think we should be praising a player for just not being rubbish, you know? Like he's doing, yeah. he's doing an okay job. He's doing it relatively well in big games. Congratulations. But you know, that's what's expected <laughs> of you. you know? <laughs> I mean, it's a, little, yeah, it's a little bit harsh, but true. Like, harsh, but true, harsh, but true in some ways. I mean, my, like, you know, Aaron said you need guys like El Nenny in your squad. Completely, you know, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Uh, touching on the point about new contract. Do you think that, look, given the fact that we're probably going to play European football of some nature mm. yeah, next season, do yeah. we need to give him a new contract or is it move I don't, know, it I don't know if we need to give him a new contract. I think, um, yeah, like, look, again, it kind of, I said this uh, the last episode, right, about Nketia and if we get Europa League, um, he's kind of an ideal Europa League player for the first six or eight games and your, your, your cup games. And I think El Nenny's falls into that kind of bracket. Um, so, so, and, and obviously, look, you know, he's he's been very, very good the last couple of games. He's proving useful, like his squad um, his use in the squad is is you know kind of we're seeing the the benefits of having him in the squad. Sorry, at the moment. So you know it's always good to have a player like that around. It's hard though because you kind of feel like with how we're trying to transform the squad and what Arteta and Edu are trying to do, um, we're obviously trying to kind of move away from we're trying to shift away from where we were kind of under Emery and sort of the back end of the Wenger years in terms of some of those kind of legacy players that have been around and um, it's. It, it, yeah, so I, I don't know. To I think if we get Europa League, I wouldn't I wouldn't be upset if we if we kept him. If we get Champions League again, I wouldn't be too upset. But again, if it means that he's holding onto a central midfield squad position ahead of, you know, a better option out there potentially, then that would obviously be quite disappointing. Are we, are we realistically going to get an option like him, who's happy to play three or four games a season? Like we're not going to sign someone. A squad like it's really hard to sign these types of squad players when if they're not Lakonga types who yeah, are I mean his experience coming, brings who, a lot. yeah exactly yeah 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 so like I think it's one of these I, I wouldn't I, if he if he didn't sign a new contract and he left it's not like I'm going to be you know kind of crying for five days or whatever <laughs> getting over it at the same time if we give him a new contract he's going to be on low wages um you know we know exactly what we're going to get from him um you know I'll be I'd be I'd be okay with that but um you know, he's not like he's going to become first choice anyway. So it's it's all about, you know, the balance in midfield and making sure that, you know, if there are attainable options that can serve as squad players, but also kind of build up experience and are a much higher level with a higher ceiling and higher potential, yeah. then I'd, I'd rather have those in the squad. Uh, but it is a tough one because obviously, you know, you're going into, you're going into Champions League, it'll be Arteta's or Euro, Euro, European football. But if it's Champions League, it'll be... Um, Arteta's first season in the Champions League and he might he might just say you know what this guy's completely dependable I know exactly what I'm going to get from him um, he's obviously very well liked around the squad as well I think a lot of people uh, a lot of people say that a lot of the, a lot of the squad have said that when you watch some of, some of the media stuff so he might be you know maybe maybe, maybe uh, Arteta will turn to him and, and, and they'll offer him something but I would have thought if he was going to stay they probably would have like I don't know. Do you not think they well, would have it, just it does, it does feel like they keep talking about how with pretty much everyone's contract situation, they keep saying, seemingly saying we're going to wait till the summer, Talk wait till the summer, yeah. wait till the summer. I guess that's because of what's at stake and where we could finish is still so variable. Mm. I, I think we could do a whole episode on, on squad building and squad yeah, for next say. season, to be honest. <laughs> it's a big right? topic. It is, it's, yeah, exactly. It's massive. Um, and I think, <clears throat> you know, what, what just, I guess, just to close on that point, from my perspective, if we look at the teams in the Premier League who are established Champions League side, so there's three of them. Um, if we look at those three teams, you know, if you, you if you look at the squad depth they have, for example, in central midfield, for, for argument's sake, you know, let's just take Chelsea. Even they've got their their El Nenny alternatives are are far superior, in my opinion, to you know to El Nenny. I mean, you, you know, even though I think they they tried to get Sal Niguez. I know no Sal didn't hasn't had a very good season, mm. but that's the sort of player that they try and get. For their like fifth choice central midfielder, do you know what I mean? It's a, 
but anyway, we'll we'll do a, I'm sure let's do a whole thing on squad building another time. But his his central midfield partner yesterday got man of the match. Uh, Granite Xhaka, you know, who Mize, you and I talked about in the last episode, is, is uh, you know, arguably is he is he our most important player like right now, given Partey's mm-hmm. injury. I mean, his his goal on on Saturday, where we sit, it it effectively, if the ball went through the net, it would have hit us in the face. Yeah, basically, that's a good way of putting, good way of putting it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's just it was just a bullet. Absolutely, we had a brilliant view. You know, just <laughs> just we saw the gap. You know, the gap and the ball mm. come through the gap and a bang. What a goal! What a, what an amazing goal at such a ridiculously important time when tides were going all over the bloody place right you know we we you know when it was 2-1 and then they have the penalty they score the pen if they score the penalty it's all changed and then it's a bit like oh my god what's going on like you know arsenal back in it whatever da-da. bang goal 3-1 at that point the, there's a whole different dynamic you need mm. big players to step up in in big moments take control of situations did granite Xhaka, you know did, did, my summarize to me you know his his performance on Saturday and um, you know, talk to me about that goal as well. Yeah. He had another very, very good game. He's been playing really well recently. Um, you know, kind of, kind of similar to what Aaron and said, you know, I think when Jacker has a good game, like what you were saying about on any, when Jacker has a good game and has a period of good games, you're kind of like, um, you know, you're kind of overly impressed, but he's just doing what he should be doing to a certain extent. But look, I'm not taking away from how, how well he played. He was, he was very good. And that kind of a, a Jacker El Nenny, partnership seems to be working really really well at the moment um yeah look his goal I mean look what I mean what you know what else could, you, you described it perfectly in terms of our our view of it we had like perfect kind of line of sight of of, of it it was just a you know as sweet of a strike as you'd ever as you'll ever see um and yeah it kind of you just felt as soon as the ball hit the net you just felt the tension just release from all around the stadium because yeah like you say that for that second half we came out um, or United came out and were completely on top of us, and we were really kind of under the cosh for for most of that that second half. And yeah, the penalty was clearly the the turning point um, in in the game because if that goes in two two, you know, we were talking to a few United kind of mates of mates um, after the game, and and they said it, and you probably have to agree, you know, if if United get that pe- score that penalty, then chances are they there's a good chance they go on to win the game. Um, so yeah, yeah, no, look, Granite Jacker, I think he's doing the business at the moment. The interesting thing, and it comes back to what you said, like having that squad building discussion and what decisions we make around certain players, you know, does that change people's opinions of uh, what we should do with him uh, in terms of this summer or in the future and potentially replacing him? I'm not sure, but, a cl- but clearly he's, you know, we've said it, right? He's a manager and the coach's favourite. Um mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, like, no, he, he, yeah, he, he was fantastic. I mean, so just, I mean, to put it into context, it, how, how I look at his performance, right? Before the game, we weren't sure who was going to play central midfield for United. And we knew Pogba was out. We knew Fred was out. And then McTominay was back. And as soon as we, I think we talked about it, the four of us or with Nero just before the game, and, you know, McTominay was named in the starting lineup. And we were kind of like, oh, he's going to have a really good game. And McTominay and Jack, are, I feel like they're quite similar players, like very com- combative, very, you know, they like a tackle. They get stuck in, um, uh, very aggressive. And I feel like Xhaka, I, I, I didn't see much from McTominay that game. And that's probably partly or mainly down to how well Xhaka played. So, yeah, overall, very, very impressed with how he, what he's doing at the moment. And his goal kind of just, you know, whenever a player scores a goal, like whenever a, like a midfielder scores a goal, it just adds, you know, you know, if they were playing at a 7 out of 10, it kind of makes them, makes their performance an 8 out of 10, right? So it just kind of adds. But, yeah, and I'm very, I'm very, very happy for him as well because obviously he's had a ridiculously tough time with us and um you know what, what happened against palace a couple of seasons ago um you could tell by that interview you did um recently it's still kind of sour it's still a very very sour moment for him as well as for us so um you could see and again you could see in the celebrations right you know he ran to the north bank to block six and um you know the celebration with kind of it almost felt like there was a bit of a what's the word um it's like a relationship building moment mm-hmm. um of repairing the relationship kind of moment. So yeah, yeah, very nice. And yeah, very happy for him that he got that goal. Aaron, and you mentioned, I think, a stat. Is there something ridiculous, like a ridiculous portion of Xhaka's goals for Arsenal have been against Man United? Yeah, like oh, the, wow. 33% of his goals in the Premier League have come against Man United, I think, which is, there, there is, there is probably really annoying. He's probably scored Man like United nine goals or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I think to add on the Jacka thing, like I've never been a huge Jacka fan because not because I think he's a bad player. Is that I don't I actually think he's a very good midfielder technically. My only issue with Jacka is he is almost guaranteed to cost you six to nine points by himself a season. Um, just because he either does something stupid or referees think he does something stupid. And yeah, so you can argue how much of that is his fault and is that reputation like costing him, but you know, that that is what you get. And you know, let's let's be fair, there have been times this season where he probably has cost us points. I think he's been sent off twice this season already. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um and that is what you get with Jacques. And I said this at the start of the season when we he did sign that new contract in the summer, right? Or did he not? I think he signed a new deal, yeah. Yeah, he signed a new deal. And at that time people were like, what are you doing? And I said, you know, Arteta's made the the calculation to say, look, he's gonna this guy's gonna cost you cost you six points a season, nine points. I'm gonna hope I can get that down to zero points, but he probably will cost me. But outside of the times that he's not costing me by doing stupid things, he will be a very, very good midfielder. And that's what he's showing. And he has been really good. I was really impressed with him on, on Saturday. And again, against Chelsea, he was also very good. And we've needed our senior players to step up during this bad period because for so long, we're just like, we can't keep relying on players like Saka, like Smith, Bro, to, like Martinelli to bail us out. The senior players like Lacazette, like Xhaka, uh, well, like Party, if he was fit, they need to step up and own this. Yeah. And um no fair play to him he has and like you said the, the goal isn't what we expect doing we don't need him to score goals but when it comes like that one was just so important and in the context of this run and the context of you know where we may or may not end up at the end of the season that could be a very very big goal yeah, you, um, I, I was just going to ask I was just going to ask so obviously he was heavily linked uh, with the move last was it last summer after the Euros or yeah, during the yeah. Euros it looked like he was off and then obviously now he signed this contract extension but um now that now that he's have he's having a pretty decent season, obviously he's kind of getting you know leading up to the summer, he's putting in good performances. Do you guys think that you know I think it was Roma or Mourinho wanted him, and uh, maybe a few other clubs now might be looking at him. Do you think that we like what do you think we should do? What do you think we will do? Do you think we because we could probably cash in on him for a decent ish amount? I guess I wouldn't personally. I wouldn't sell him. I'd I'd like to see a central midfielder come in to challenge for his place. Um, and either that means Xhaka gets better or we find someone better who probably doesn't have the reputation and the kind of errors and issues in his game that Xhaka inevitably does. Um, I think Xhaka is a perfect type of player you have in your squad to say, you know, for example, when Partey got injured, if Xhaka wasn't first choice, if Xhaka was coming in, mm. it would feel a lot more relaxed. A bit like El coming in now. We say we'll bring Jacko in and he can do a job. You know, if we're one nil up or two nil up in a game, or even if we're chasing a game and you want someone to suit the system that we're playing, Jack is ideal for that. And I think it will be pretty hard to find someone better. But again, I don't know who who would get. But yeah, I I think selling him would be unless it was good money. Um, given we're going to need more midfielders, I think Jacko is someone you want in your squad. Yeah, agree. there's two other reasons, I think, as well to, to note. One is, I think Arteta towards the back end of this season has been the first, it's the first time any of our managers have played him further up the pitch and, you know, making whoever his midfield partner is play that kind of deeper role. And that's kind of, I think, started to eliminate some of that, some of the liability that, you know, is sometimes associated with Xhaka. So firstly, I think, him in this role, in this role further, further forward, seems to kind of be working, and 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 it's not exposing us in the same way that it had been before. The other thing I think is that look, this is a guy, this is a guy who, under the Emery era, I you know I know he got his captaincy taken away for for reasons that everyone you know knows only too well, but it was kind of a consensus driven captaincy, right? And the, the 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 squad allegedly voted him as the captain that they wanted. He's obviously someone who is respected by the squad, and we are going to need some of our older players around, older heads, Lacazette's probably going to go, etc. So for, for a number of reasons, I think he still needs to be there. And it feels like he wants to be there. feels like, you know, the manager likes him. For all those reasons, I would keep him. But if I could just move on from that uh, now, guys, because because I think, again, related to Elneny and Jacker, is 
the, the roles they play and what they do and how that works really allows the people above them to kind of do what they do. And I was really confused against United as to why United didn't do more to just try and stop the supply to Odegaard and try and control that. Because in the games that we lost to Brighton and, and Palace, I, you know, I've said it before, I really think that was something both those teams did well, figure out a way to, to just kind of get Odegaard out of the game, really. Man United just, I don't know if they tried to do that, but couldn't because of the good job everyone else was doing. But Odegaard had had so much of the ball. And I, I mean, I personally thought he was, he was magnificent. Myers, what did you think of his performance? Yeah, I mean, again, like, um, he's it's, it's, it's an interesting one, right? Because we watch him very closely, obviously, because we're, we're Arsenal fans and we're kind of analysing every single player's performance. I think when you speak to, um, when you speak to fans of other clubs, um, well, basically our mates, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like he's just, he's not appreciated. He's not appreciated at all. I think the job that he does, it's not even the job that he does, but the, the, the control he brings to a match and the number of matches he consistently kind of runs, like he basically running matches, um, is, is, is kind of crazy considering again, you know, he's still a pretty young player and well, his first full season, in the premier league, um, yeah, like he had again. He had a very, very, a very consistent play. He had a very good game again. Um, I, I feel like that that link up. So, so there's two things I was going to say. It kind of leads onto a, a separate point slightly. But so the first thing I was going to say was the link up that he's got with Saka. Um, that's just like blossoming. Mm-hmm. Where I, d- I don't know if you guys have noticed it um, or if it's a very obvious thing or not. But I feel like every time he drifts out to that right hand side, him and Saka seem to have this kind of like. Um, connection basically on the pitch where they both seem to know where each other is is going to be and they can anticipate each other's movement and passes and especially when you've got a player like Saka who's kind of always playing on the last man and wants to get in behind and he's always willing to make that run Odegaard seems to find him more often than not and if he doesn't find him it's very patient build up play until the moment comes it's and... shades of it's shades of the Ozil Sanchez combination to, mm, to a certain yeah, extent isn't it yeah yeah and like for example you know like just to illustrate his quality, the, 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 I can't even call it a through ball, the kind of flick through ball he plays for Nketiah, the one that Nketiah misses in the first half. Yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah. It's like, you know, that's, that's really, really high quality stuff. So yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm very, very impressed with him. And it's, it's basically what you said, Raj, you know, like in those games that we, we struggled, Erdogan struggled basically, or Erdogan struggled, struggled to get the ball. Um, so it's obviously, like I said, it's very obvious how much he is, you know, controlling games in the final third for us. He basically dictates the play. Um, everything goes through him. Um, and that's what happened. That's what happened um a lot of the time on, on Saturday. Um I was gonna start talking about ESR, but I guess I guess we'll finish talking about Erdogan first because it's kind of linking linked to it, but not not really. So I think I mean, we can, we can, sorry, I mean, Aaron, yeah, sorry, Aaron, go for it. Yeah, no, I think the other thing on Erdegaard is, you know, you, you asked, like, why, why didn't they stop him? And I think one thing that we didn't really pick up on was actually the role that Eddie is playing in this and Eddie and Ketia, because yeah, it's a lot easier to squeeze that midfield space when, as a centre back, you don't have to worry about Lacazette running in behind you, or you don't have to, I mean, worry about even Lacazette trying to get into the box. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> He's got the ball. And I noticed, you know, I almost want to say, like, with Eddie on the pitch over the last two games, it's almost been a bit of a glimpse into the future of what a team would look like if we had a, a really good striker. And no, no disrespect. <laughs> yeah. Gabriel Jesus. Gabriel Jesus. So, yeah. <laughs> we need a whole different podcast for that <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah. Um, like, just to, because, you know, Eddie is, you know, again, I, you know, a lot of respect for him because he's a youth player, but he, He's not a top, top striker yet. Maybe he will get there. Maybe he won't. But just for the fact that he's hanging around on the last defender, he drifted wide quite a bit. And he was just occupying the centre-backs that in a way that Lacazette doesn't really do, just meant that it makes it 10 times harder for them to deal with Odegaard as well. And not only that, when Odegaard has the ball, he's got someone to aim for who's making a run into the box usually. Or if a player gets wide, there is someone trying to get into the box and make a run across to the near post sometimes or just someone like that through ball that he missed someone to put him in behind and and make it work and like when I see that I get really excited because I'm like okay well this is what we could look like and this is how we're going to create chances and actually you know Eddie might take some of these chances over the next couple of games and I hope he does but 
hopefully if we've got someone who can do a bit of what Lacazette is doing in terms of bullying and dro dro dropping back and occupying defenders physically, as well as actually providing a threat in the box. That to me is really exciting because I think the player who will benefit from the most from that the most will be Odegaard. I think it's fair. And and also it having a striker to worry about, it, it allows Saka and, and, and ESR or whoever it is playing on that side to be less occupied and for you know yeah. defenders just 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 to think about it more. So let's talk about ESR and Saka guys. Uh, so so Miles, you wanted to talk about ESR. I mean the two of them, I think I think I saw yesterday, I think it's the are Arsenal the? I think they're the only team in the league this season who have got two players under the age of twenty-one who have scored ten plus goals. Mm -hmm. But I feel that it's if I can't recall the stat properly myself, but I feel it's the first time in quite a while that any side has had two players under the age of twenty-one who have scored ten plus goals. I mean, Miles, do you want to leave with the ESR? It sounded like you had a point that you wanted to. Yeah, make something about. something I just noticed during the game. I think I said to one of you guys, or maybe both of you guys, like so. I did feel like there were periods in the first half, especially where um, we were obviously, I don't feel it was struggling, but when we were trying to play out and, you know, the ball would get to El Nene or Xhaka, there wasn't the out ball um, or the, the vertical pass as often, like the option wasn't there as often as um, it could have been. And I just, you, 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 you could, from where we sit, you can, you can't see the kind of the depth of the pitch as it were, but you can see kind of left to right across the pitch. And you can see Tavares is, you know, he's kind of occupying that left flank. He's pushed quite high up. And then Smith Rowe seems to be in this kind of no man's land area where he, he wasn't dropping deep to come and get the ball off um, El Nen, whoever the central midfielder who had the ball was. Um, and he was playing, playing this kind of inside forward role. And I just, I just felt like, I don't know. I just thought it was a bit, it was a bit of a weird one because He's obviously very good at carrying the ball. He's obviously a very good passer of the ball, all of that kind of thing. You know, technically he's, he's fantastic. And um, yeah, I just, I, I'm not sure what the reason was, but it felt like he was kind of making, he was making runs past the last defender. No one was ever trying to pick him out. And then he was coming back and then resetting and trying again. And it just didn't seem to really work. And I was getting quite frustrated because I felt like I would rather he drop deep, pick the ball up from Jacker, and then was either, you know, you know, going out to Tavares, coming inside to Erdegaard, whatever. But then it kind of opens up a few more passing lanes. So that was something that I just picked up on as I was kind of observing observing the first half. But um, it wasn't wasn't so much a criticism of his performance. Maybe it's a, delib a deliberate thing that you know something that Arteta wants to do. I'm not I'm not really sure. But yeah, I was a little bit confused by kind of his positioning in the first half. That was the point I wanted to make. So I mean, it sounds like you know from what you're describing, um, and. You know, I've had to question myself as to, you know, whether I'm bit, I've been harsh on ESR recently as well. Um, and I wonder if it is like what you're suggesting in terms of, was this a very intentional tactical pl uh, ploy uh, uh, that Arteta has given him? As Arteta said to him very specifically, you've got to do these things, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe, and maybe that's what's causing some of this behavior. But I, I can't help, and maybe it's because I feel Saka is really setting the standard. I can't help but feel that Saka is able to um, influence games on a much more consistent basis, is able to put in top performances on a much more consistent basis. And I, I feel harsh if it is a case where Arteta's telling ESR to do things, you know, for the team, et cetera, et cetera. But Aaron, and I mean, do, do you see do you see a gulf between the two of them in that way? Or do you think I'm being harsh? Yeah, I think you're being harsh, mainly because we can't keep comparing every young player to Bukayo Saka. Mm -hmm. Like, like we're having this conversation with Smith Bro, who's got what ten goals a season, yeah, or something, mm. yeah. Like that is the guy is having a phenomenal season, regardless of what Saka's doing. And likewise, we can't compare every other academy player to Smith Rowe either, because both of them are having phenomenal seasons. Yeah. And actually, what they're nineteen twenty, um, that is not the norm for any young player coming through. They are phenomenal and performing way, way above anyone's expectations, and they've come through in a way which is. Like they've, you know, they've had a season. I know Smith Rowe had a season on loan. I think Saka never really went on loan anywhere, yeah. but they've come through and basically nailed first team places with places by like 19, 20. Um, you know, the normal thing is the player comes through, plays maybe one or two games, and goes on loan for a season, comes back, maybe plays four or five games and works their way into the team. So, no, I, th I don't think I'm not super worried about Smith Rowe. I think what will be interesting over the next couple of years is what his role in this team will be. Um, because I think he does look best on that left-hand side, but then we've got Martinelli who can play there. And, you know, Arteta did take off Smith Rowe after about 60 minutes mm -hmm. 
uh, when we were just 2-1 up. I'm not sure if that was before the penalty or after the penalty to bring on Martinelli. But I don't know. I, I kind of see... It almost reminds me of um, Freddie Lundberg in a, in, a, yeah, yeah. in a bit where it's like, actually, from what I remember of Freddie, I know it was a while ago, but Freddie never like dominated games in the way that like Saka does. But then he just pops up and just scores mm. like important it's, goals. It's a good comparison. Um, and if, you know, if Smith Rowe gets to that level um, where he just continuously scores important goals and that's his role in the team by making late runs and just finding those moments, that's cool because that's kind of what he's been doing this season. Mm. But I do think there's a, you know, there's more there from just scoring important goals. And I think he has the you know, the ability to dictate and run games himself. And he's maybe that's our expectation because we want to see more of him because we know he's capable. Um, but right now he's doing this thing where he's just scoring goals. And that's also cool. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, let, let's see where he goes. But it's I'm not super worried. And the fact that Arteta is starting him mm. just shows that actually he trusts him over someone like Martinelli at the moment, maybe. And, you know, you, to your Lundberg comparison, I think there was that season where Lundberg scored, I think, eight goals in eight games or something like that when we... Yeah, were on the way in the title. 2002, I think it was. Yeah, right? yeah. When, so if, yeah. We can, if we can get some ESR uh, consistency like that in terms of goals, yeah. and, you know, I'm sure we're going to be achieving what we want to achieve this season. Look, there's there's lots more we can talk about with regards to the game itself. There's lo- There was so much, so many talking points. There's Tommy Yasu coming back. There was kind of VAR being used a lot. Um, you know, sometimes it looking like we were getting the rub of the green actually... There are there are decisions that perhaps actually. Um, I was just going to say we do you got uh, so I didn't realize this during the game. Sorry, I know, I know you're probably going to move on to the next thing. I just yeah. wanted to quickly mention it. Um, having watched the highlights and some of the post match stuff, yeah, mate, we were so lucky to not give away. I would say there were three pretty good penalty shouts from United. There was the the Suarez handball, the Cedric handball one. I don't know, like you, I've seen them given before. Is the dot? He looks like he scoops. But did they say hand. that was? And they didn't give that because he was falling down or something like that. Yeah, but if he, I think you've seen those ones. Like he, his hand movements just very weird. Isn't that one of those? It, that if the, yeah. if the referee gives it, then the VAR doesn't overturn it. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. But I feel like we were quite lucky. Because, yeah. Yeah. And then the t- two Tavares, like Tavares. Yeah. Uh, there were two, two on. Alanga. I think both on Alanga, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm surprised not like I'm surprised both of them weren't given to be honest, if not at least one. Very, very surprised, especially because it's United. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I agree. I think we my broad takeaway from the game yesterday was we 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 got pretty lucky. Um, but then at the same time, I think there was a Fernandez tackle on yeah, Tavares was, as well, right? I, I didn't see that in the game. I didn't and, realize Yeah, that, I didn't realize right? at I mean, the time. But so, so I don't think any of us realized at the time. I, I suppose the my, my counter to that would be because I think you're right. I think all the replays show that's mental that he wasn't setting off. But we're three one up at that point. Yeah. So, it, you know, some of these things, some of the decisions that I think we got quite fortunate about were at more precarious times during the game where, yeah. you know, it really could swung in a, in a, in a different but direction. I think it just shows kind of like overall officiating, and as, as we keep saying, and, and especially and VAR, it's just it's pretty poor, that, isn't it? Not up Pre- to scratch at yeah. all. I think my broad takeaway from this game actually is. I think we did get pretty lucky, but at the same time, in some of those last three that we lost, yeah, yeah. there were times we were very unlucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it kind of just evens itself out a bit. I think it, it does. I think we were we lost we lost to Man City at home. We were unlucky for we were yeah. unlucky. We we could have had a penalty. They arguably shouldn't have had one. You know these things. You know I, I don't think they always even out. I don't. You know I remember Arsene Wenger is one of these people who always says that's such a silly argument. They don't always even out, but. At the moment, it's the way it is. I don't think there's an agenda against us necessarily with some, the stuff, you, you know, you win some, you lose some. Um, I want to move on from the game because, you know, there's, there's a couple of things, that, there's a couple of, uh, you know, other big topics that we need to talk about. So, uh, you know, after the game, we're in a great mood. The, the drinking very much continued. Uh, we went to the pub to watch the Burnley game. Not uh, Burnley, we're at Brentford, Tottenham game. Um, and obviously it would have been amazing if Brentford won. They didn't, but they got a draw. They probably and should have won, by the way. They probably like, should with have. hindsight. They should they I don't think Tottenham Tottenham had a shot on target. Tottenham like haven't, haven't had a shot on target for two games. Yeah. It's mental. It's mental, isn't it? Who would have thought that? Who would who would have thought the way things were going when we had lost three games in a row, would we have scored seven goals against Chelsea <laughs> and United and Spurs not have a shot on target in two games, given their strength is literally two world class players in Son and Kane. Attacking they players scored, tw- I think, 12 goals in the previous three games. Like the three just games, makes no yeah. sense. I, I was 
this doesn't surprise me the Spurs. I, mean, I think the thing that is more on us is that like I have this scoring seven goals in, in two games is for us ridiculous, like amazing. Um, but Spurs are Spurs. Right? This is what they do. You must be sick like, mate. I think we're both, we're, surely we're all a bit surprised that they've lost to Brighton at home. No, and... But they, they always do this. This is like, I knew, like if we were winning, like if we were capable, if we had our best team, I'd be almost certain we'd pip them just on results because they, they do stupid things all the time. Like we do stupid things all the time, but they're the one, uh, probably one of the very few teams that do it slightly more. <laughs> um, and I know what you mean. And it's, the, it's a DNA yeah. thing. And it's just, it's just what they do. So, yeah, they're, yeah we're, we're, we're confusing, but they're even more confusing. And their fans must be like, I want to just wonder how they're feeling at that moment. Because um, I, have, I have very little yeah. sympathy for a lot of their fans. And there are some, listen, there's a couple of uh, Tottenham fans I know who are like, you know, top, top, top guys, really level headed, genuinely. Um, but there's a lot that have been talking way too much recently, right? About, uh, you know, I'm not going to mention who he is. There's someone who recently tagged the place that he was in as the champions league yeah on social media and and i was like wait what are you doing like i'm sorry but uh, so th- this leads me nicely onto this the, the you know top four so somehow from losing three games in a row and it going well oh, really bleak you know we've played the same amount of games as tottenham and we are now two points ahead of tottenham um it's bizarre we're two points ahead of tottenham man united you know, am I going to eat my words? I think we can sort of forget about them now in terms of the top four. I mean, there, there are a number of points behind and and we uh, Tottenham and Arsenal have a game in hand. Mm. So Tottenham and Arsenal really have to, really have to tank both of them for, for, for United to, to get up there. Um, how do you guys feel about top four now? Like, so, you know, we've got, I think only five games left, isn't it? Is it five, five games? games? Yeah. Something ridiculous. We're only two home games. Um, Aaron, and what, what's your feelings? You were ninety nine percent sure <laughs> at one point. This is just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, where's the, where's the dial now? So I look at the table now, and I'm still like amazed at how we're in this situation. Um, that's my I'm like, how are we? Like, I saw it after the after the Spurs game, and I saw the pet table, and what we're two points clear of them at the moment. Yeah. yeah. I'm just like, how has this even happened? <laughs> so, you know, I've always said though that. I'd rather be behind Spurs for as long as possible, just because when we go in front, the pressure's back on us. Um, and, you know, the minute, you know, like we saw, like the minute Spurs were ahead of us, they just started dropping points and bottling it. And we also have that in us as well. So that, that's the one thing I'm worried about is that the one, the minute we have, like we're in front, we have the gap and it's ours to lose again. I feel that it makes us a bit more vulnerable and I worry a bit more. Um but like I said, if you'd offered me this situation at any point in the last six months or so since the start of the season, I would have taken, I would have grabbed it and run because this is a brilliant position to be in now. Like, will we do it? I, I have no idea, right? <laughs> because um, I think obviously it will come down to Spurs away. But there is, a, you know, the fact that they've got Liverpool in two weeks' time, and let's hope Liverpool win could mean that if we beat West Ham and Leeds, we go to White Hart Lane with a five-point gap. I was going to ask um, this. So, yeah, sorry, sorry, carry on. But, but was, yeah, okay. like, the, you know, this is, you know, it's impossible to predict because would we have predicted that we would lose to Southampton, Brighton and uh, Palace? No. Would we have predicted that we'd beat Chelsea and Man United? No. Would we have predicted Spurs would have lost to Brighton and drawn away at Brentford? No. So... Like logic, logic kind of goes out the window at this point, and we just got to roll with it. Hope the pressure doesn't get to us. Do what we can, and ultimately, if we can win our next two, I mean, every game you look at it, every game has narrative, and every game has a bit of risk, right? Mm. Like West Ham are a good team, still possibly in the race for Champions League place. Leeds fighting for survival. Newcastle, like, really on form at the moment. Everton fighting for survival and then there's Spurs. So none of those games are going to be easy, but at the same time, yesterday, Brentford had nothing to play for, really, and should have won. So who knows? Like, I, I, am I more confident than I was two weeks ago? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I'm like, I have no idea, man, <laughs> basically. It's, it's, it's weird, is it? Because the, I think the thing that I feel 
um, after these results and given our situation is I'm just very confident now it goes, it'll basically go down to the final day. What do, yeah. what do you think? Do you, what do you think will well, do happen away at Spurs? Well, this is the thing. So, so I guess it's kind of building on what you were saying before, which is, let's just say if we beat West Ham, let's talk, we'll talk about the West Ham game in a second, but let's just say if we, if we do beat West Ham and Tottenham don't beat Leicester, yeah? And then okay. Tottenham go to Liverpool the next game and lose. Let's just say that happens. It is, it is very difficult for them at that point. But, but I still believe that, you know, going back to your original point, all of a sudden, it's suddenly ours to lose in a big way. And I'm not really sure that's a good thing. And then going to Tottenham, if Tottenham then win, then even if, even if they win and actually they're still, say, you know, a few points behind us, I, I don't know. I like. I, you that, know, I'd yeah. still worry about us. If we lose that at Spurs, that at Newcastle Spurs. away on a Monday night becomes really tricky. Yeah, exactly. Right? And exactly. that's where things get. Awkward. Exactly. The Newcastle away is after Spurs, I think. Right? It's Spurs, Newcastle, then Everton. I think. Right? Or um, it's uh, Leeds, Spurs, Newcastle, Everton. Yeah. 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 Spurs, yeah exactly. I mean, Myers, what, what do you what What do you think about this? Mate, I think I think the thing the takeaway for me from the last few weeks is you like Aaron said, just have no idea. You can't predict on a game like you 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 literally can't predict on a game by game basis. No one would have thought we would have, we'd have, we would have lost those three games that we lost. No. Sorry, my Apple Watch is going crazy. Um, no one would <laughs> no one would have thought that we would have yeah lost those three games that we lost, and no one would have thought that we would have beaten Chelsea and United. So. And Spurs, as Aaron said, are just as random. So uh, I, d- I really don't know. But I, 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 so the, 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 the interesting one is that when you guys were both talking, you both kind of, and it's natural to do so, and I completely get it, and it makes sense based on form and everything, that we're just assuming that like, Spurs are going to lose to Liverpool. I'm a little bit, yeah, yeah, I'm a little bit yeah. hesitant about that because it's the kind of game that, I could see Spurs getting a result in. Like it's the game that they probably should just they 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 should get they yeah, Liverpool should smash them, but it might not happen that way. Like kind of what happened with Spurs against City. Mm-hmm. Um and I think I think Liverpool would have just played the second leg of their semi-final the week the a couple of days before. Um they played Possibly, Spurs. Yeah. Might make a difference. I don't know. Um, depending on what happens in their semi-final. I, I I am feel like I'm overall obviously feeling a lot 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 more confidence. I didn't expect Spurs to drop points. Not not so much. I didn't expect expect them to drop points again. Um, a couple of days uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago, whenever it was yesterday, wasn't it? Was it yesterday? Yesterday was yeah, yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't expect them to drop points, but it was it was yeah. I was quite, it was more in hope hope that they would drop something. Um, and they did. And it's very weird because then you could go, you could see them going and playing Leicester and 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 scoring three or four goals so um I don't yeah I I, I, you really can't call it I am feeling a lot more confident and you look at the table and you think bloody hell we've got a two-point gap on them now and there's not many games to go and there's not many points to play for if we can get to the North London derby where it's almost like we don't have to win like a draw kind of is enough Mm. with two games left after that like if basically what I'm saying is if we, if we have a bit of a buffer and we can draw that game and then just go and win against Newcastle, go and win against Everton, obviously that would be a fantastic position to be in. Um, but it's interesting makes- though, isn't it, though, Mas? Because again, you know, because of the way the results have gone over the weekend, the relegation battle looks crazy as well. Yeah. And those teams that we play at the end, on paper, on paper, you'd look... On paper, you'd love to play teams like Leeds and Everton, you know, the, your last couple of home games of the season. But geez, like that could be them survival. Those are survival games. This is the thing, right? Because Burnley, Tottenham Burnley is the second last game of the season. Yeah. And then we play Everton. So it's a question of, do you want Burnley to be safe? Uh, sorry, do you want Burnley to be fighting for their lives? Um, which means that the game against Tottenham, they need they need to win or they need to get a result. But then that obviously means if they get the result, then it means the Everton game that we have the last game of the season, Everton probably get, it means that they need something from the. Yeah, from the ideally we want Everton to be down at that point, right? But for that to happen, I think they probably need to lose every single game or something. Mm. Yeah, basically we want to be in this ideal situation would be that Burnley Spurs game is if Burnley get a result, it relegates Everton. Yes. yes. Yeah, that would yeah. and then Burnley go and do it. Yeah, yeah. And exactly, that would yeah. just be really funny because that, that would be Frank Lampard getting relegated, which would just on its own be hilarious. That, that, <laughs> but, um, that be <laughs> bit it? harsh. <laughs> it would be funny. I am. Um, um, yeah, let, let's 
so directly the next game, what's quite interesting about the fact that we've got West Ham and they've got Leicester is that both Leicester and West Ham have European semi-finals, yeah. you know, either side of it. So both both Leicester and West Ham have got a game this Thursday. They've got European semi-finals. And then yeah, obviously they 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 play us. Now, I'm not sure what this is going to mean for team selection. I think that given that West Ham have lost again today, means that they're probably what should I say? Uh, I think they're putting they'll put way more eggs in the basket of of winning the European trophy. Um West Ham have kind of got a situation, right? They, because right at the end of the Chelsea game, they got a player sent off, which effectively means that they've got no available centre-backs, no senior centre-backs available for our game. To add to the fact that they will probably have an eye on their, their the next European fixture, you know, which mm. we're sandwiched in between. Listen, obviously Leicester, you know, will, will be in a similar situation with regards to that. But just, just looking at us and just looking at West Ham, I think on paper, a lot of people would have said, all right, narratives aside, situation aside, away at West Ham this season is actually quite tricky. But you've got to take into context all of this nonsense, right? This this is, you could not pick a more perfect time to pay, play West Ham yeah. away, quite I mean, simply, right? You look, at, yeah, you look at their team selection today, um, they rested like all of their big big guns, basically Rice, Antonio, Bowen. Priority, priority for, for Moyes is, is obviously the, the Europa League game the Europa League semi-final is their first semi-final in like 50 years or something ridiculous like that your first um European semi-final in, in 50 odd years um you know he knows he knows if they can get to a, a European final and win it that's like history made for them it's like us winning the Champions, the Champions League, League. Yeah. they'll be in the Champions League they'll be in the Champions League they would have won a major European competition like he he knows it's three games so yeah if we if we don't go and beat like if we don't go and beat West Ham on the weekend I'd be, I'll be, I will be very, uh, like, uh, I think that that could potentially be one of the worst results, not of the season. Like, that's an exaggeration, but that, that's, that's, that's bad if we don't go and beat West Ham. Because surely, unless, unless they like win the first leg, like 5 0 or something, which I can't see happening, no. um, assuming that sort of the ties at home first leg or away first leg. I have no idea. No, no right. idea. Check. But, Check. Um, you know, assuming that first they're leg kind home of is first it. leg. They're right. Okay. Home. okay. okay. So basically, let's assume that they need to rest players and they're going to rest players and for that second game. They're going to rest. They, they don't have a Man City squad. They don't have a Liverpool squad. They're just going to have to rest the big guns again. Um, yeah. And uh, like you say, Raj, no no fit, fit centre-backs, no Dawson for sure next game. I mean, like, yeah, it, it, we absolutely have to go and win on Sunday. We've got so much to play for. Um, it, yeah, I, I just can't. You know, obviously, obviously, it doesn't work like this. We could go and lose the game. We could go and draw the game. But I'd be very, very disappointed if we don't go and get three points. Equally, Aaron, and you know, the managers often say this that in situations where you've got a situation like this, where you're trying to save players and all the rest of it, you run the risk of playing a weaker team and getting absolutely annihilated, and that really affecting the squad in terms of. You know, I, team, if I'm West Ham, I don't think I care. Like, I genuinely don't think their fans will care. What happens to them against us on Sunday? You mean the if players' the, mentality, right, Raj? Players, yeah, I mean yeah. the players' mentality, yeah. But you think that what they will then therefore risk, like think they need to. You think the what's, players' what's mentality, risk, if it, they get battered, they, you think they won't be up for it? No, I don't think. I, I, I don't think know. Can, I'm, I mean, I'm throwing that out there, but you know, I think that that is something that is that that is a risk, right? You know, you I think if I'm Moyes, I just like compartmentalize whatever happens yeah. in this game as you know it's almost like a, a league cup game right like they rest their players they get battered you just say it doesn't matter it's a league cup just get back to the league the focus is on the league um and i think that's what Moyes will probably i hope well, at least i hope he does um to his team i know like i looked at the table now and they they could quite easily catch man united and they might be fighting for sixth place because i think that gets them automatic europa league um but they can probably still catch man united anyway is what i'd if I was thinking about it that way. But I think the worry is that, you know, the players that they play instead, and I don't know who would play, but those guys would be hungry to, you know, make a stake for their first team place and they'll be really up for it. And that's the worry. But honestly, I think I'm, I'm just, regardless of what happens in this race with other teams, I think I'm feeling a lot more confident about our state because yeah. A, we've seemed to found, we seem to have found a way to score goals again which is good with Eddie. 
Um, and also the fact that Tommy Asu is now back, um, which will give us a bit more defensive solidarity. I know he only got a couple of minutes, but I hope he's got another week on the training ground. We don't play till Sunday. Then we've got another week till we play again. You know, I think the key is that he gets match fit and he's ready for that Spurs game. And I don't know how many minutes we'll give him. Hopefully he gets a start on Sunday. But I'm just feeling a lot more confident about our ability, regardless of the team that West Ham play, to just go there and win. Um, and yeah, and that, that's, that's the main thing. Let's just go game by game. Forget about what other teams do. We know it's in our hands. Let's just take it. Every, and we know that if we win our next six games, we're there, right? And it may be even yeah. the case that if we win our next five, we'll be there and we don't have to worry about Everton at all. That'll be even better. But yeah, let's just West Ham go there and see what everyone else does. Hope Leicester can get something against Spurs and then on to the next game. I think it's fair. I mean, Mize, do you, do you think that there's any danger whatsoever? Or no, although this is contradictory to the fact that they have no centre backs. Do you think there's any danger whatsoever that Moyes just goes this in the air? I've got to rest a load of players. I don't really want to get battered. So my best chance here, the best thing for me to do is just set up really defensively and actually just defend and hope I can kind of get a draw or, or, or a smash and grab. And, and therefore for us to kind of play away from home against a low block, do you have any of those concerns? I wouldn't say, I mean, look, maybe that maybe. <laughs> I don't I personally I don't think you'll approach like that because I feel like they're in such a good position and they have they've had such a good league campaign again obviously they've kind of tailed off a little bit in the last few games um I don't I don't think you'll look at it as it's absolutely crucial that we get like a point from this game or we you know we 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 do a smash and grab essentially and yeah sit back soak up everything that Arsenal have got to offer and then go and hit them on the counter I don't think you'll look at it like that I think you'll probably I mean, I didn't watch their game today against Chelsea, to be fair. I saw that they rested a number of players. I didn't watch the game. I know it was 0-0 till, till the last minute, but I don't know how the game panned out. But yeah, I mean, look, yeah, in summary, no, I don't, I don't, miss, I'm not too concerned about that. I feel like I can't, what, the way Aaron put it was very, very, very good. You know, we've got the quality, we've got the players to kind of unlock them if that is the situation. Um, we're scoring goals now. Players are on form. That I guess the the probably the biggest worry is Saka limped off the other day, and we don't yeah, know what's happening. Course, with yeah. that. Mm. So you know, if he's not fit, that kind of you know, um, yeah, he's such a big player for us. So that's obviously a blow. Um, but yeah, like I, I just, I honestly think if you look at West Ham as a club and the situation that they find themselves in, like my, the area I live in is West Ham. My 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 wife's family is all West Ham, so I speak to West Ham people, people fans every day, right? <laughs> not people. Um, and so, you know, this, this, this like semi-final is like, it's like us getting, like I said, it's like us getting to a Champions League final and winning a Champions League final. Like it's, it's on another level where they, are they ever going to get back? Like when are they next going to be in this situation? So I think their game against us is probably more of a minor, is probably more of an inconvenience compared to how important the game against Frankfurt is. Mm -hmm. And they must be buzzing that they're not playing Barcelona as well. Like, it's probably so much more, like, they probably mm -hmm. would have loved to have gone and played at the new, new camp, but from a, you know, getting through to the next round or getting through to the final, playing Frankfurt is much more, you know, it's much more likely that they're going to get through. So I think he's going to put all his eggs in that Europa League basket and try his up, utmost to to get through to the final obviously he's going to do that but yeah and I think when you're West Ham not no disrespect they don't like I said they don't have you know quality they don't have another Declan Rice they don't have another Jared Jared Bowen they don't have a, have another striker let you know Antonio is their only striker option pretty much so um yeah I, 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 I I'm like I said I think it's going to be a rested team a weakened team and we just got to, we have to take advantage we've got so much to play like we've literally you know five games to go 15 points to play for We've, we absolutely have to go there and win. And if we don't, like, obviously we're going, Raj, right? If, yeah, it'll, I'll, yeah, like, they'll be very, very disappointing if we don't win. And it'll be a very, very sad, long journey home for me. Um, quick, quick journey from, 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 from Yeah, quick journey for you, long journey for me. So, guys, I, I think we'll call it this. You know, thanks a lot for the chat. I mean, look, we've had an amazing week. Um, can, I, can I ask, can I ask we, a question, guys, yeah. before we end? So, yeah. yes or no, are we getting top four? Because we, because because after those three losses, we were all pretty much know. If you had to, if you had to put uh, Rogers Tavares's winnings on it, 
<laughs> then we spent them all on drinks we and did. food. Yeah, we did. Yeah. I am. Um, Miles, to be honest, mate, I can't. I think so you, have to, like, you have to say yes or no. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to say oh. no. Oh, really? I'm going to say no. And But my, my reason is I can't get past how unbelievable it was for us to lose those three games out of nowhere like back mm. to back to back like and i could have expected us to lose to palace but i didn't expect us to lose those next two games three in a row so i think what really concerns me is that there there is no i don't see any of our remaining games as being easy on their day okay west ham like we've described it it really should be um but yeah, you know us is probably the easiest game yeah, of the exa- now. exactly yeah. when would, exactly now when would you have said so so all of these games can suddenly become hard or easy like depending on what happens the week before so it's mad mm. so i just can't you know i can i can picture i can easily picture a scenario of us losing to tottenham losing to newcastle and then like losing one of our you know whatever the home game is afterwards you know, is that everton is the final game maybe whatever it is whatever it is i can see i can easily figure that out so i'm gonna go no so basically we, we would if that if that happens so you're basically saying we probably beat west ham <clears throat> yeah leads okay fine but then if we're losing two of those last three games we basically bottled it yeah I don't know if you call it bottling it. Well, if we don't, so. mate, okay, if, put the Spurs, Spurs is North London derby is North London derby, but if you're losing to Newcastle and Everton or not winning both of those games, well, I think Newcastle is a top game. I think this tough is game. my, I probably agree. I think if I had to bet my life on it, I'd probably say no. Well, well, um, well. And I think <laughs> it's that Newcastle away game yeah. that really, That's really me worries too. me. Yeah, me too. Monday night, Newcastle oh. away, Newcastle playing well. Like the only hope I have there is that they might just see the end of the season by that but point. Who, and who the have they beaten in this run? That they've they're, they're ninth like, now, right? They're ninth. Um, yeah. Like, and okay. they're defending well now, keeping clean sheets. They've turned Bruno Gumarish, our old friend, into um, <laughs> uh, a box-to-box elite midfielder. Um, they're probably on like five million quid goal bonuses nowadays. All of them, um, and I mean. That's they, they got, I think I think we'll beat West Ham. I think we'll beat Leeds. I think the way we get there, if we get top four, is for Spurs to drop more points. Okay. I mean, um, they last. They last. I was just going to say Newcastle's last four games. They beat. Ev- though they lost. Sorry, they beat Wolves one nil. They beat yeah. Leicester two one. They beat Palace one nil, and then they beat Norwich three nil. Like, yeah, they're not well beat. It's fine, but. I don't yeah, know. I just Palace think that Spurs, place is... And yeah. prior to that, they got thrashed by Spurs 5-1. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fair, 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 fair. Like, obviously, we, I'd love it if we did it. I'm not saying... I just... It's just that we've been hurt games, in the past. Yeah. They've yeah, mentally... So you just, you're just covering <laughs> yeah. yourselves to not get hurt, basically, which yeah, I get. So. Yeah, those exactly. three games like, mentally crippled me. I right. think because I wasn't at Brighton as well. I wasn't around for Brighton. Yeah. But especially that Brighton mm. game. That it's just hard. a reminder when you think you're out of it where you're like, oh, we are now, you know, the banter era is firmly over. Yeah. They just Bre- remind you. <laughs> <laughs> but Brentford Spurs did remind me that Tottenham aren't a very good team. Well, this is it. it goes back to my point, right? Not exactly. at all. Like, we, because, yeah. we banter ourselves off a lot, but the one team that does it more than us is the team that we're up against. Yeah, because they, um, they, ju- they actually just looked, they looked really basic against yeah. Brentford. Do you know what I mean? And that, Brentford that's... should have won. They hit the post. I think. Yeah. Uh, I think Tony missed the chance. So, yeah. Oh, I th- fine. Let's I see. Think, let's see. I think it's gonna be stressful. I think, I think we're gonna do it. I think, I think the last do. couple of games have convinced me. I, I, yeah. If you'd asked me two games ago, I would have said the same as you guys. No way. I but... don't want it. What I don't want is for it to go to the last game. I think if we do it, the way we have to do it is Spurs just completely collapse. What a last game! What a last day that would be. All of us at the yeah. Emirates when we get top four. I think I'd like to turn up there, just have a nice day when it's done, just celebrate, knowing we can lose five nil to Everton, and we'll be we'll be fine. <laughs> um, but you know, goal difference. We haven't even spoken about this, but goal difference could be a thing too. Um, and the Spurs' goal difference are like I think they're about six or seven ahead. So we need Liverpool to smash like five past. We them. really do. We yeah. Really do. At least Liverpool have got you know they're still in the race, right? Um, all right, guys. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, and, and and anyone listening, I really hope you enjoyed our chat today. Um, not exactly sure when we'll record next because obviously Sunday is a Sunday game, isn't it? But we've got a bank holiday weekend. I keep forgetting. It's oh a yeah, bank holiday weekend is crazy. So we'll figure out when we're going to record, and hopefully, um, you know, it will be a 
a nice, happy recording following a, a victory against West Ham, hopefully. Um, so let's just see and hope for the best. Cool. Guys, thank you. Um, and everyone, enjoy your week's peace. Like, subscribe, share all of those really good things. We really, really appreciate it. Um, take care of yourselves. Have a good week. See you guys. Cheers, guys. Bye.